gives me pleasure, uh, Jay, um, to welcome you to the um, land of the Muscovy people, the uh, traditional unceded uh, territories, and we should be grateful that we have the opportunity to live and work in this beautiful place. Today is um, today is a great day, right? This these are my favorite seminars. These are seminars with uh, our students who have done their work and are about to graduate or on their way. And we have two such today. Um, today we have uh, started Brian. I'm not Brian's supervisor, but in loco parentis, uh, Mark Johnson is his supervisor. Brian completed his uh, undergraduate degree in UBC 2019, specializing in atmospheric sciences and hydrology. He worked in Andy Black's biometrology and soil physics lab and um, building systems to understand land atmospheric exchange of water and green greenhouse gas fluxes. He found a passion in environmental instrumentation and combined with this hydrology interest, he naturally went to work with Mark Johnson. Um, for his masters, Brian is exploring freshwater atmospheric carbon interaction and applying his instrumentation skills to perform long-term monitoring in a challenging field environment. And then he's gonna graduate and work at the Lawrence Berkeley Labs in Berkeley, California. So Brian, Thank all you. yours. Thank you, Mohan, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> how about now? My research is titled Loss in Transition, and today I'll tell you a little bit about how aquatic carbon evolves along our headwater stream network here. Um, before we start, as we start, I want to invite you to have a mental picture of the mountainous landscape unique to our local Pacific temperate rainforest. Um, in our backyard here in Vancouver, to the north, we're surrounded by 1,000 meter tall peaks with a distinct dry and wet season, and a highly productive rainforest blanket these mountainous slopes and during the summer, the trees grow fast, photosynthesize a large amount of atmospheric CO2 and store it as sugar in their root zones that they use um, in the future. And during the extended wet season, our soil kind of acts like a sponge so that every time it rains, the store sugar and dissolve CO2 from decomposing biomass, they kind of get rinsed into these high, high elevation, small headwater streams. And you can think of the stream water kind of as what's in your Coca-Cola bottle like the sugar is the dissolved organic carbon, and then the fizz that we all like is the dissolved CO2. Um, during this long period of rain, as we all know, when the rain comes, it never stops, and the dissolved organic carbon is being continuously flushed into the stream. And that, because of this process, the Pacific Coastal Temperate Rainforest is identified as a dissolved organic carbon hotspot, and the high concentration of the DOC also have water treatment implications since they need to be filtered out before the water is safe to drink. Um, we'll talk about that further in the discussions. And as the stream water travels down the slope, you can almost imagine it like pouring down a Coca-Cola down one of these peaks. The water travels through pools and riffles and waterfalls. And this similar to shaking a Coca-Cola bottle and opening the cap and that puff of CO2 leaving the solution into the atmosphere is a process we call evasion. And yeah, this uh, water air exchange of CO2 is what we call evasion. And evasion from inland freshwater is a really accounted for when characterizing global CO2 emissions, especially on headwater catchments, despite they occupy 96% of the global's uh, flow path. This is largely due to the labor intensive uh, nature to follow the conventional graph sampling approach to go out there, get a water sample, bring it back to the lab and analyze it. And also accessing these smaller high elevation streams are also hard. Um, but advances in this field in the last decade have led to a seven-fold increase in the global evasion estimate. Um, in latest one in 2023 showed 5.5 petagram of carbon is being emitted from headwater sources. And in magnitude, give that some context, that's around half of the global anthropogenic emission at 10 petagram, per, 10 petagram of carbon per year. Since long-term study in this region and the Pacific Coastal Temperate Rainforest is also identified as a DOC hotspot, this prompts the question of whether this will also be a CO2 evasion hotspot as well, due to the high steep, um, to the highest turbulence generated by these steep slopes and also the already large carbon supply from the landscape. So this research does set out to answer this question in three parts. So first we'll establish the baseline carbon budget context by finding out how much dissolved carbon is transported downstream and in, in which form, in dissolved CO2 or dissolved organic carbon. 
and of which we want to characterize how much dissolved carbon is lost to the atmosphere through evasion and how much is processed in the stream through DOC loss. And this will provide a baseline context for the temporal aspect of the research with uh, diving into the temporal variation of how these dissolved carbon fluxes vary through different throughout the year with different hydrological and climatic factors. And lastly, I wanna integrate a spatial perspective as we hone into the dry to wet season transition, since that's the period of time we know there's a large amount of carbon leaching from the landscape. And we wanna see um, landscape control on how landscape controls the observed, ob observed carbon fluxes at the soil become more saturated and connected to the stream. So in other words, how will the carbon transport change when there's a large amount of DOC being input from the landscape? So due to time constraints, we'll just give the, I'll just first give the carbon accounting context and then dive into the carbon transport content, uh, trends during the dry to wet transition. But I welcome any questions regarding how dissolved CO2 concentrated changes throughout the year, mm, the Q and A afterwards. So to answer these questions, we instrumented two sites along the same stream in UBC Malcolm Research Forest, 60 kilometers east of UBC. Um, the upstream site begins, begins at a, a lake outlet of a Blaney Lake. And this sensors installed here can capture the carbon characteristic of the water as it leaves the lake and also reflects some control of the lake on, on these concentrations. And the stream then travel through the coniferous canopy along the cobble stream bed in a pool riffle waterfall configuration for 3.3 kilometers. And the stream will lose 270 meters of elevation within the forested canyon before arriving at the downstream site that is in, close to the research forest boundary. So for this project, I assembled two automated systems and each for the upstream and downstream sites performing half hourly measurements of water quality and the sensor measuring the variables, main variables of interest for me is the dissolved CO2 and DOC. Both and all four sensors are calibrated and compared with each other before and after deployment for 15 days to identify any sensor drift during the deployment period. Additionally, during deployment, I also, um, I also went out on six different field campaigns and used graph samples and analyzed them in lab to evaluate sensor performance. I also installed a climate station and an automated uh, salt ingestion, injection system to measure the volume of water as it flows through the upstream at the upstream site. And then the stream net evasion of CO2 and the DOC loss between the two sites is calculated from these sensor differences. So I, I have prepared some video to show how kind of more the dynamic nature of the streams as they see drastic changes in the, in the stream flow throughout the year. In the drier summer months, you can see the stream is being dried down to a trickle. And then during winter storm events, water level rises drastically with our field data showing almost seven times more water traveling through the channel per second. Similar flow contrasts can be seen in the downstream site and the watershed analysis performed in GIS showed a larger area is being drained to us, this downstream point, approximately 45% larger than the upstream area. So hourly data are summarized from April 1st, 2022 to April of this year, and it shows some pretty interesting results. I've installed dissolved CO2 and DO, uh, dissolved oxygen sensors in the upstream and it showed and it was able to capture the lake's evasion characteristic and it shows 16 tons of carbon is being emitted through the lake surface every year. And as the water travels through the upstream site, it, um, it, carries, it carries 58 tons of carbon, aquatic carbon, and 83% of which is DOC, dissolved organic carbon, and 17% is dissolved CO2. And as the water traveled downstream for 3.3 kilometers, it loses 38% of the transported dissolved carbon that's um, that left the upstream site, as well as 4.4% of the DOC. Um, this is likely due to in-stream microbial processing or it's being stored in the stream bed. There are data gaps as you expect from continuous measurements, even especially for this study, half hourly data. Uh, the hourly data is only kept when both sites is functional. So once one site is not functional, we, we um, forfeit those data points. So to highlight the impact of storm events on carbon transport, I isolated storm carbon characteristics during the transition from summer low flow to the first major storm event of the year. The top bar here shows the hourly precipitation, some precipitation in millimeters, and the transported carbon is expressed as a percentage of upstream concentration, since this downstream concentration is almost always lower than the upstreams. A low ratio means that the both sites are very different, 
seeing very different dissolved carbon concentrations and a high, high ratio means both sites are quite similar. And you can already see the distinct change in the carbon transport patterns as the storm rolled through the area. So focusing into the summer, the dry season trends, the water is mainly sourcing from the lake, the soil is really dry, and the water kind of, is quite stagnant as it flows through 3.3 kilometers and it's quite slow. So this long resident time um, have an extended time for microbes to uptake the dissolved sugar that's in the, in the, in the stream. And the stream, because the stream flow is really slow, the dissolved, carbons, uh, dissolved, dissolved carbon dioxide is slowly diffusing out of solution. And it's a way slower process than a turbulent form of transport. So for, for example, if you have the Coca-Cola bottle and just opening and let it sit, it'll slowly go flat versus if you shake it and then open it and then that, that, that puff of CO2. So that's exactly what we saw in the wet season trends. Um, during, during these storm events, the whole landscape is being covered with rain and it's getting funneled into our stream. So the water sourcing is mostly from the landscape that explained why, um, and, and, and the stream travels really, uh, the stream flow is very fast. So the water stays, have a low residence time in between the two sites. So the water rushes through the streams. So this, uh, this explains for the high ratio of dissolved organic carbon, as there's not a lot of time for microbes to um, to process these sugars. And because it's more turbulent, there's more fast flow, um, it kind of drives all the dissolved CO2 out of solution, as we expect. Um, so comparing this watershed to others, we express the carbon fluxes in an aerial basis over a whole year. So the amount of DOC leaving the site is approximately 5.56 grams of carbon per meter square per year. And that's on par with similar watershed sheds to the Northeast. And during summer, periods, we saw 75% of the DOCs being consumed, as we expect in literature when longer residence time, more microbes activity, and then more uptake. Our study also showed that during high flow, the stream is very connected with the landscape, and both sides saw similar levels. There were little change in consumption. Um, uh, there was little change in consumption as the DOC is being exported. So during these large export events, it's particularly important that it doesn't overwhelm the local water treatment plants. For example, there's a lot of smaller water treatment plants that rely solely on chlorination to filter out to disinfect their drinking water, and they're known to produce carcinogenic byproducts. Um, so as far as I'm aware, there's not a lot of long-term studies in the region, um, but this evasion yield of 1.13 grams, uh, grams of carbon per meter square per year is, large, uh, is smaller than a reported boreal forest stream. This is likely due to our sensor data gaps, and this reference study upscaled their monthly graph sampling to the annual basis. But I want to argue here that the presented va evasion value is likely an underestimation of the true magnitude of evasion. Um, reprocessing, reprocessing the data using a weekly averaging, uh, improved data gaps and show the stream evasion is the same as the lake evasion. Um, but uh, so th from our data, we, uh, from our study, we show that there's a larger magnitude of evasion from mountainous stream draining these high carbon supplies lakes and they need to be considered in future estimates separate from river emissions that they're currently grouped in. And these evasion dynamics shown here it stands kind of our understanding of how landscape controls evasion as we see it with carbon supply and then the diffusion versus turbulent forms of um, control. And it's also important in a carbon ca capture context, for example, novel te techniques like lime dosing where they crush lime rocks and pull it into uh, freshwater streams, they facilitate uptake of the atmospheric CO2 into the stream. And for these techniques, they need to prove uh, long-term storage as the water enters the ocean. So we need to be, um, we need to be mindful um, of downstream losses from the treatment, such as the evasion of CO2 to the atmosphere and these processes need to be accounted for. So, oh. so in conclusion, um, this study showed the annual magnitude of aquatic carbon transport and emission in our unique man landscape. There's an interesting laboratory to study evasion that there's abundant supplies of carbon arising for our productive forest and there's also the steep slope there to drive evasion into the atmosphere. And this study show a significant amount is being emitted downstream of a lake, a process that would have been um, missed if we group headwaters in the same category as rivers as they have different emission patterns. And this study also found that during the dry summer to wet winter flushing of carbon, they need to be captured with a physical based approach to represent a true, true magnitude. And this will help include mountainous streams 
draining these high carbon supply lakes in future estimates. Yeah, thank you for the network, for the funding. Thank you for Mark and thank you for everyone for the technical support, lab mates, and also IRS friends for all your with the thesis and presentation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it will be different for the dissolved organic carbon and the dissolved CO2. Dissolved organic ca carbon, when the soil is being really dry, there's a lot of storage of sugars and um, in those soils. So for example, a couple years ago, there was the big flooding in Chilliwack, and that's because of really dry soil is being dumped with a lot of rain, and that creates these high turbidity events, they call it carrying a lot of the dissolved organic carbon and particulate like suspended kind of fuzzy looking um, sediments in the water. Um, they carry these into our drinking water. And for a, for a community, for example, in Vancouver Island, Mount Washington is a small ski resort. They treat all their drinking water and they would not have the capacity to deal with these high turbidity events. And there's a federal guideline saying that if these turbidity, turbidity events extend beyond a day, over the whole calendar year, they need to invest in better drinking water treatment. So I think in that sense, climate change might um, create more of these turbidity events um, and imp different impact to different level, different communities. Um, the soft CO2, um, there will be more degassing, but I think the main impact would be, um, would, would, it will be a, in, the dissolved CO2 will see indirect land use changes impact or like climate change impact on the terrestrial because dissolved CO2 is almost like a response of the terrestrial landscape into the water. So I think it will probably depend on what the process is. is. Like for example, forest fire will, um, will kick up a lot more sediments and um, I'm, yeah, I'm guessing they will have less CO2 in there um, into the streams. Mm -hmm. right. You, I'll repeat the question. The limiting. Um, the question is, if there's a large increase in dissolving car carbon, how the water treatments adapt to these higher levels? Is that a question? Okay. Um, they would use maybe more, the prime, the, almost the default of the industry, from my understanding, is using chlorination. So they just dump chlorine into the water to disinfect these dissolved organic carbons. There are other ways to treat your water. For example, like filtering, and there's also UV vis, which is what we have here in uh, in Vancouver, and they were able to handle a higher level of VOC and also have the capacity to treat more water. Um, but these systems are really expensive. I think Victoria last year was just contemplating and purchasing one such big upgrading their facility. Um, I think it was bullet no. Um, because there's a high level of financial and engineering barrier to treat these waters. And I think a parallel focus that right now in the industry is to better protect our drinking watershed. Um, so for example, like um, in, in New York a couple of years ago, their drinking watershed was closed off and protected instead of upgrading a multi-million dollar drinking water facility. And I think they're trying to manage their landscape properly, like not clear cutting their forest and not dam like not altering the landscape in such a way that will create these landslides and high turbidity events as it comes downstream. But they also have storage at these come in, if they have enough storage and have a well in intake for the facility, then these they were able to close the intake and use their storage to wait for these high turbidity events to settle down. But that's also another approach. 
Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. One of, one of the arguments I'm making here is like trying to start representing, oh, sorry, repeat the question. Um, how reproducible is the study? And if we're installing this setup somewhere else would get you a different characteristic. I think um, when you think in terms of the whole flow path, you have these like rain, uh, water stream that's kind of dry off in the summer because there's not a lot of uh, source water. That, that dynamic will be different than if we're, we're now funneling into a lake now and that em emission pattern will be different. I, I was interested in from lake to whitewater because there's the high storage of carbon in the lakes as it drain out, we're suspecting it might leave the solution. Um, and as it go into bigger rivers, as, as the waterfalls will do one thing and then now into bigger rivers, it's more stagnant, it's, there's more biological activity and, um, so the evasion, the dissolved CO2 will mostly be controlled by the biological activity in those bigger streams, because as you can imagine, there might be more fish and there's more growth, more productivity. Um, so yeah, so I think to really represent this region, um, you need to capture all the flow character, uh, carbon characteristic across this whole flow path. Um, and if you change the system altogether, for example, if we go to the Great Lakes in, in Ontario and the east somewhere more flat, then the dissolved carbon characteristics will be totally different as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, the evasion flux is calculated two ways. Um, so there's the lake evasion and there is the downstream evasion. The lake evasion is calculated with dissolved um, oxygen sensors. There, if you can imagine the standing water, um, there, when there's sunlight, there's a lot of photosynthesis happening in, this, in the water and that kind of draws down the, um, that, count, that draws down dissolved CO2 and draws up dissolved organic car, uh, dissolved oxygen. And then when the sunlight leaves, photosynthesis stops, the atmospheric dissolved ox, uh, atmospheric oxygen will come in and re-aerate the water. And that, um, that kind of give us the gas transfer velocity. Then that is multiplied by the gradient concentration gradient between the water and the air. And that kind of is what gets the evasion flux out. And downstream uh, evasion is taken as a uh, sensor difference. So upstream, I have one sensor, downstream, I have one sensor. And um, before deployment, they were like, make, make sure they're the same. And, and then I spatially spaced them apart, assuming there's no additional um, dilution or input. And that's my evasion from the sensor difference. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, so our second speaker for the day is Julia Bellotti. Julia came to IRIS after doing a degree in political science at the University of Trento. And as an undergraduate, she was involved in climate activism of various sorts. And so she came to BC to work on multi-level tr energy transitions, about how to think about multi-levels of governance and energy transition. But she came to Vancouver and guess what? She got suckered in to the housing debate. <laughs> and so, um, so her, her project is, uh, looking at the Broadway line and housing debates therein. And so um, I won't speak much more to it. Uh, it's, it's some great work here. But Julia's also um, got other things on the go. She's very busy. She's working on another project looking at uh, marginalized communities. It's funded by CIHR and marginalized community, communities and uh, their responses, their experiences with heat waves. 
So that's one project. There's another project she's working on, looking at increasing youth involvement in climate activism. And this is just two. There were several others along the way. And all along, she's been working uh, extremely hard on uh, the Broadway plan and working on it as the plan has been evolving. So um, I'm sure you'll enjoy this talk. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. So today I will be presenting my research, navigating sustainability, affordability, and livability in Vancouver's Broadway plan. Um, before getting started, I'll give you a bit of context, although I know that some of you are already familiar with these issues. So the Metro Vancouver region is expected to accommodate about 1.5 million people in the next few decades. However, growth today is mostly happening in peripheral areas. So Richmond, Surrey, and all these neighboring municipalities. And this is sometimes problematic because it leads to urban sprawl, which is notoriously associated with negative climate and environmental consequences. Transit-oriented development is considered a very popular solution to prevent sprawl. And Todd aims at making cities more compact by building housing around transit and encouraging mixed land use close to, uh, to transit stations. However, transit-oriented development, as you can imagine, is often highly contested at the local level, with some residents being strongly opposed and others uh, supportive of uh, development projects like this. So as we will see, the case for the Broadway plan. So what is the Broadway plan? The Broadway plan is a plan in line with Metro Vancouver regional growth strategy, which encourages transit oriented development in the region to prevent sprawl. And the project was initiated by the city of Vancouver and the regional transportation authority, TransLink, um, to support the extension of a SkyTrain line that you can see there, the Millennium Line. The plan covers 800 and 585 city blocks and established neighborhoods. And transit-oriented development projects are often not only concerned um, with climate and trans transportation goals. Um, and in fact, the, broad the Broadway plan aims at uh, building inclusive, complete, and affordable transit-oriented communities. To do so, the Broadway plan envisions different strategies. So while the Broadway plan area currently has a population of about 78,000 residents, um, the plan aims at accommodating up to 50,000 additional residents by 2050. And when it comes to housing, the area um, today hosts about 50,000 households, and it is characterized by a wide mix of housing types, with 37% being a purpose-built rental. And this percentage is extremely significant because it represents 25% of the total number of purpose-built rental in the city of Vancouver. However, one of the main challenge is that this housing uh, stock is aging and is uh, repairings or replacement. And therefore the plan aims at adding up to 30,000 additional um, homes by, 20, uh, by 2050, with the majority of them, as you can see there, being purpose-built rental. And also the plan includes some tenants protections um, in order to minimize displacement as these um, major uh, changes occur in the area. So when it comes to my research questions, I asked two different, my, my study asked two different questions. The first one being on what grounds do urban residents oppose or support transit oriented development projects such as the Broadway plan? And is it possible to reconcile residents' concerns and priorities to chart a way forward, or does polarization dominate the discourse? Um, and today we will be answering the first question. So to answer this question, non-participant observation of public hearings and semi-structured interviews were adopted as methods for this research. Last year, in May 2022, I sat through all the Broadway plan public hearings for a total of 28 hours um, of speaking time with 100 and non-residents um, speaking and expressing their opinions. Um, unsurprisingly, however, I realized that speakers at public hearings tended to overrepresent certain voices. Um, and therefore, I decided to conduct semi-structured interviews um, with those who were generally not represented at these hearings and not, not present at these hearings. And therefore, uh, conducted 19 um, interviews uh, with local groups, experts, and government officials at various levels. 
I used grounded theory for both my data collection and my data analysis. This means that I build theory directly from the data in a highly iterative process. Um, data co collection and analysis were conducted concurrently public hearing data informing my research questions, but also informing the design of the interviews, including participants recruitment and um, the, the interview questions themselves. And eventually I found myself with an incredibly expensive data set with more than 20 hours worth of data um, in total to analyze. And data was coded um, in various cycles using an inductive approach, but also acknowledging that of course I might have been influencing by, influenced by existing theory as I analyzed the data. So as I analyzed the data, I tried um, to identify a framework to categorize residents' opinions and to help me better understand major trends in the data. And initially, I thought of merely using the not in my backyard and yes in my backyard framework. So the NIMBY YIMBY framework that probably every one of you is, um, is uh, familiar with. And these terms are also very commonly used in the literature and in practice to describe debates about urban development projects. And we know that in the literature, NIMBYs are usually described as um, residents who are well off, generally older, uh, property owners and offer active in local politics. While NIMBY is a term, um, a more recent term, which is generally used to describe um, the movement that originated in opposition to NIMBYism. And NIMBYs tend to be renters and younger than NIMBYs and mostly young professionals. However, as I explore the data, I realized that another group was emerging from those opposed to the plan. This group consisted of residents who were mostly renters, low income, and often excluded and marginalized from these local politics and planning processes. For this reason, I decided to introduce the term FIMBYsm, public housing in my backyard, um, to represent this latter group. And this is a term which is often used in practice, but not, but not really um, in the literature, but it was necessary for me to introduce it to distinguish between two very different types of opposition to this plan. It is also important to note that these items do not, these three terms do not absolutely represent um, some monolithic uh, groups, but archetypes. So this is not a straight categorization, but a way to make sense of residents' perceptions, recognizing that, recognizing that these groups do intersect and that their opinions and these individuals, as we are about to see, are incredibly more complex than a mere categorization. So moving on to the results, uh, the framework that it shows really helped me identify the main themes that were associated to each group, but also to tentatively treat these opinions to one of to, to these three archetypes that I identified. So I found that residents that I assigned to the NIMBY groups uh, really valued the preservation of the system as it currently is, and therefore disliked the Broadway plan, which was interpreted as a major change to the status quo. FIMBYs instead were definitely not satisfied with the system, with the way the system worked and interpreted the Broadway plan as a mere continuation of the status quo, and those strongly opposed it. Um, lastly, Yimbi supported the Broadway plan as they interpreted it as a series of changes within the system um, that were going to push Vancouver closer to its climate and housing goals. And each group, as, uh, each group proposed a different set of policies, as you can see here, um, according to the main concerns and their main perceptions. So we will now explore a little bit more uh, in detail the motivations of, um, of each group for opposing or supporting the plan. Starting with the NIMBYs, uh, neighborhood character was definitely prevalent um, in their discourses. And these included concerns about shadows, about setback, um, about density, and in general, the built form. Uh, and towers were especially disliked. Uh, neighborhood character was also often associated with uh, livability. Um, the vast majority of discourses surrounding sustainability were around towers. Um, so towers were perceived as highly polluted due to the use of concrete and their energy requirements. Um, the importance of neighborhood character uh, was related to a process of romanticization and idealization of community and the past. 
It is important to mention that many residents belonging to this um, to this group and associated with this group were older, and therefore their lived experience of the city was very different than the than the one of other groups. Um, these residents, for instance, took part in old community community planning processes, um, and felt like they really contributed to the development of Vancouver, to the development of the city. For this reason, change was considered negatively. Speakers often referred to a lack of data about population growth and about housing, or, um, and about, uh, housing already approved, claiming that population is actually not growing that much and that there is already enough housing in Vancouver. These often pointed to a very interesting tension between current and future residents, but also between people inside and outside of the city. According to many, the Broadway plan was not considering current residents' needs and concerns. And since change was negatively perceived, the main responsibles for this change, namely developers and overseas investors, were considered um, negatively and negatively perceived. And so was the city, who was basically making this change possible. Um, the city in particular was accused of encouraging growth instead of managing it. Um, and city staff was accused of wanting to turn Vancouver into an average American mega city. City staff was also accused of appro approving the Broadway plan to make land more expensive and therefore be able to extract more property taxes uh, from residents. And interestingly, the term housing crisis was never used. The term housing affordability crisis was instead preferred because its residents knew that lack of supply was the problem. And lastly, high property taxes and lack of affordability together were going to displace not only renters, but also homeowners. Turning to NIMBY's, Yimbi's perceptions, um, Yimbi start from a very different assumption to NIMBY, um, namely that the population in Vancouver is actually growing because Vancouver is a highly desirable city. However, according to these residents, geographical constraints, but especially local opposition to new housing, did not allow new and do not allow new units um, from um, to be to be added and to be built. This opposition was attributed to the so-called cult of home ownership, namely the role of home ownership uh, that that home ownership plays in the Canadian context, culture, and institutions, and at both the local and upper governments, policymaking incentivizes home ownerships through various policies like zoning, regressive taxation, and scarce funding for non-market housing. And this is believed to create a distortion in the market and, and cause a housing shortage, where housing supply cannot keep up with demand and leads to the housing crisis that we're currently experiencing. And in this situation, gentrification and displacement do exist, but they're not caused by density or by development, but rather because there is not enough housing for people to move into once they are displaced if death happens. So if density and development are needed, it follows that developers are not actually evil creatures, but they're perceived as important actors and stakeholders and housing providers. Even private developers are very important because housing of all types are needed, not only public housing. And in the case of Yimbi's um, discourses around climate mostly focus on the importance of housing and amenities near transit and never really mention the sustainability of buildings. Lastly, building, um, Yimbi residents seem to trust the city staff and the Broadway pl plan policies, although some claim that the plan is not ambitious enough and should add more housing and more building heights. So lastly, turning to uh, Fimbi perceptions, the most important theme identified here is that housing should be a human right, guaranteed to all by the government. And this was often contrasted uh, to the current housing system where housing is treated as a commodity and, a, as, and a, as a financial mean. To blame uh, for this is the system, the system and how housing uh, works within this system. And in this context, developers, investors, and corporate landlords are some of the responsible for um, how the current system and the, for the current situation and how the current, current system works. This is because these actors provide inadequate housing, which is culturally inappropriate and defined as luxury, extremely expensive, unaffordable, especially for families and for low-income renters. For this reason, FIMBI residents do believe that the issue is partially supply, so there is a lack of supply, but it's lack of supply of affordable, adequate, and suitable housing. 
Most residents belonging to this group feel extremely vulnerable in their housing situation with no policies whatsoever protecting their tenancy. And this derives um, from past experiences and due to past experiences of um, displacement, um, they do not believe that the Broadway plan tenant protection policies will work to protect them. Um, because there is fundamentally, according to them, a power imbalance between developers on the one hand and the city and residents on the other, um, and tenants especially on the other. And then this insecurity of tenor leads to gentrification and risk of displacement. Together with the inadequacy of existing housing, this makes Vancouver and especially the Broadway Plan neighborhoods uh, gated communities for the wealthy, where other people cannot really uh, live and build community. And for Finbis, um, livability is really reflected in community and accessible spaces where this community can be built. So just to summarize some, uh, some final takeaways, um, of course, as you, as you probably noticed, housing really um, took the center, the center stage of these debates, although the Broadway plan is about other, um, other goals. And when it comes to NIMBY residents, for, for instance, we can clearly see that livability concerns are prevalent in the form of neighborhood ca character. And interestingly, negative perceptions of towers also seem to extend to sustainability claims um, focused predominantly on the carbon emissions associated with towers and with buildings. Similarly, also for NIMBY's sustainability and livability seem to overlap with sustainable communities characterized by density near transit also being extremely livable according to, to them. And finally, you probably noticed that in the last slide about FIMBIS that um, these residents did not really mention sustainability in, this, in their discourses. Many mentioned that lack of access to transportation network, many mentioned that they actually lacked access to transportation networks. And therefore they mentioned that having affordable housing near transit was the only way for them to actually take advantage of these sustainable communities that the Broadway plan was actually introducing. And I know that this was a very, um, very broad overview. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your question. I wanted to thank every one of you for being here and for supporting um, every day, um, for supporting me every day. And also of course my supervisor and committee um, member Terry and all the participants in my study. Yes, Mauricio. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Mauricio. I'll repeat the question. So the question is around change and whether during these public hearings, especially uh, developers and city staff in particular, mentioned the fact that cities have been changing and therefore that participants and residents should expect that to happen, right? More or less. Um, so the, the answer is actually this very interesting dynamic happened do, during those hearings um, where city staff tried to really understand concern by residents, especially residents who feared um, to abrupt change. And therefore, city staff very recently came up with the so-called pace of change policy, where 
development was supposed to be slowed down a bit by adding more requirements for development to happen. Now, city uh, council did not accept this policy, so they did not move forward with that, thinking that tenants' protections in the Broadway plan was, were already going to slow down the pace of change. But often, um, city staff did not really respond to residents' concerns because for how public hearings are, for the because of the nature of public hearings, they're not really a conversation between people, but it's rather people go there, talk about what they think. And then council, council, council members, they can maybe ask questions, but not really, they refrain themselves from commenting, right? So there were definitely comments about change, um, but developers who developers did participate in the hearings. Um, I did not have uh, the chance to interview them, but many of them participated. And most of their concerns were actually getting rid of any requirement that could slow down the pace of change. And that's what they talked about. But they never explicitly talked about how cities generally change. That was recognized by residents, but the difference is that some wanted change to happen faster and others wanted change to happen very slowly. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes. Thank you so much. For very relevant question. So the question was whether uh, sort of if I see more nuances when I interviewed people rather than at the public hearings and, and more or less the differences that I, I could see when I interviewed people rather than uh, the data that I collected from the public hearings. And this is a very interesting uh, question because the answer is absolutely yes. There were way more nuances when I interviewed people, but also surprisingly, some people belonging to the same groups, and I'm not even talking about NIMBYs, NIMBYs, and FIMBYs, but people, for instance, belonging to co-op, um, co-ops, housing co-ops, they had very different opinions when it came to the Broadway plan. So for instance, people who participated to the public hearings um, who were uh, living in co-ops were opposed to the Broadway plan. But then when I talked to people during interviews, they actually mentioned that uh, they thought that the Broadway plan was a good idea. So definitely through interviews, I could get more, I could really get a sense of the city of these arguments and really understand how people, um, like what was behind people's motivations rather than in public hearings where people had only five minutes to express their opinions and they usually had prepared um, their, their speech with the, with the main points. While during semi-structured interviews, responding to my second research questions, whether or not we can actually chart a way forward and whether polarization, we can, we can overcome this polarization, the answer would be yes, more after the semi-structured interviews rather than after the public hearings. Because it's after semi-structured interviews, people really explain the reasons of, and the, the motives behind and they could really, and they really showed that there might be some ways to move forward with a solution that I'm not saying that makes everyone happy, but at least a solution that can move move us forward towards some, some middle ground. While in public hearings, that was not the case. Yeah. Um, Tatiana. Yeah, thank you for the question. So the question was about um, more or less how many people are actually in support or in opposition to this plan and how many people in the city of Vancouver would actually 
belong to this to these categories? So the answer is um, there are there have been some some surveys that have been administrated to the to the population of Vancouver saying that about two thirds of the population is actually in um, support of project. So there seems to be more support than opposition to new housing. However, public hearings are very, in public hearings, uh, speakers are self-selected. So you would never hear, which is the reason why I really wanted to conduct interviews because there were just voices that I could not hear there. For instance, newcomers, organizations, indigenous housing providers, they were just not present in those, at, the, at those public hearings for multiple reasons because this fora are very exclusive and not inclusive. Um, and therefore there seems to be more support outside out there, but it is not reflected in current in, in, in institutions. And part of my thesis as well, try to look for a way forward, not only when it comes to policies, but also when it comes to engagement processes that are more equitable and, and inclusive, which right now is definitely not the case. Um, but yeah, but also I want to stress that there are various types of opposition to this plan and some of them really need to be considered because it is true that the situation of tenants is dire in this city, especially low income tenants. So that is something else that has to be stressed. It's not that we have to proceed like a train with development. We really need to get people together and find a solution to that. I don't know if this... Yeah, this way. <laughs>